This is episode number two of the Supernatural book. And in this you're going to see Creation Week, The Battle Begins. So far we've seen that Lucifer's rebellion had caused the Lord to bring a catastrophe onto the creation. Look back at Genesis 1.1. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And that's a complete creation right there. And we already saw in Job 38 how the sons of God witnessed as the Lord laid the foundation of the earth. And we talked about how that's not humans there, that's the angels. And you know the story. Lucifer rebelled. He said, I will be like the Most High. Most likely, a lot of those angels rebelled with him. But the Lord came back and said, you're not the most high Lucifer. You'll be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. An everlasting fire was prepared for Lucifer and those who rebelled with him. And this would have been when hell was created. In Matthew 25, 41, it says, Then shall ye say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Lucifer's not in that everlasting fire yet. He was left out because he will present the rest of the creation with a choice. And the devil would eventually go around making deals with God's creatures. He would seduce. He would beguile. He would entice men to sell themselves to work evil in the sight of the Lord. And they may not sign a paper contract with the devil, but they come to a place in their heart where this temporal, temporal world means more to them than God does. Means more to them than their soul. But when Lucifer rebelled, the Lord brought a catastrophe on the original earth that left it without form and void. Just like it says in Genesis 1-2, when the earth was without form and void. See, in verse 1 you had a complete creation in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. Complete creation. Then Lucifer rebelled. God brings a catastrophe on the earth and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. If you saw the world as it was in Genesis 1-2, it was without form, dark, empty, and it looked uninhabitable. That isn't how he originally created it. If you look at Isaiah 45-18, it says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. He said there is none else. Not Lucifer, not the angels, not the cherubim or the seraphim. Isaiah 44, 8 says, Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. That's the Lord saying that. And to some of the angels or other heavenly hosts, it might have seemed at this time like darkness had gotten the best of God. Then something happened. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. He moved on the waters that were already there from the catastrophe. And God said, Let there be light. This is day number one. He says, <clears throat> let there be light. You can imagine Lucifer, who is now the devil, watching the Lord clean up the mess the devil made. Clean up the mess that he himself made. You know, he's looking down there and he sees. And I imagine the brightness of that light showing up, blinded the serpent's eyes and all the angels with him, at least for a split second. And men love darkness rather than light. I imagine evil creatures do too, if they're rebellious like him and his angels one of those evil angels might have said wow it's the sun and another might have said that's not the sun you idiot it's just light you see satan would be looking at the creation week in anger and rebellion most likely plotting how he could ruin the new earth and god said let there be light and there was light and god saw the light that it was good and god divided the light from the darkness 
And so the battle begins. Throughout this supernatural book, you'll see light versus darkness. The angels chose sides already. Some chose Jehovah. Some chose Lucifer. It is light versus darkness. God shows you that you have to be divided. Throughout this book, you will see men choosing light or choosing darkness. People will be choosing sides, choosing their king, and choosing their eternal destination. And this is why God allowed Lucifer to do what he did in the first place. He gives the creation a choice, a free will. Genesis 1.5 says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Going against God, as Lucifer and many angels did, was going against the Ancient of Days. They rebelled against the one who named the light day and named the darkness night. The angels may not have signed a physical piece of paper that sold their allegiance over to Satan, but they shook hands with the dark side of their heart. They began to say things in their heart just as Lucifer did. You see, day one was a statement from the Lord to the dark side. He said, let there be light. Now, day number two, you have the firmament. Genesis 1, 7, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. You see, the firmament is where God puts the sun, the moon, the stars. There is water above and below that firmament. The verse lets us know that God has a body of water separating him from his creation. And the book says, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. You see, the body of water under the third heaven is most likely the primary dwelling place for the devil in his new natural state as the dragon Leviathan. Revelation 12.3 describes him as a great red dragon. Job 41.31 says he maketh the deep to boil like a pot. You see, he still had access to stand in front of God's throne and accuse men who were soon to be created. He's going to accuse men day and night, as it talks about in Revelation 12.10. He's the accuser of the brethren. But his doghouse was in those deeps. And he has a really, really long leash. But above those waters where he dwells is a sea of glass like unto crystal. It is as a molten looking glass as the Bible describes it. It says in Revelation 4, 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And under that sea of glass is an enormous body of water. Lucifer, who is now Satan, the red dragon, still approaches the throne to accuse the brethren before God. But he's been cast out of heaven positionally. No longer is he the anointed cherub. But back to the creation. You see, God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. The firmament, what you would know as outer space, is, is called heaven. The devil and his minions' primary dwelling is the second heaven and that great body of water out there. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, as Ephesians 6.12 would say. You'll notice the second day where God creates the dwelling place of the devil is the only day that isn't called good. Now, day number three, the dry land appears... The seas and the earth brings forth grass. Genesis 1 9 says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. The dry land was already there, you see. He just gathered the water together so that it could appear. Who could fight against God? He's got the power of water manipulation. He maketh the sea and the dry land. He can take any amount of water and move it anywhere he wants to move it. He is the Lord, which maketh the way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. Imagine Lucifer looking down on earth as God uncovers the land where his throne used to be. And he is reminded that he is a has-been. 
and he hears those words of the Lord echo in his mind, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. You'll be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Genesis 1.10 says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. When you go against God, you're going against the being that made the earth and named it. He could spin the earth on his finger like a basketball or a snow globe, depending on how you look at it. Isn't it funny how all the other planets are named after false gods, but the one the Lord named is called Earth. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. You see how easily God brings forth trees? Do you think God's main concern is with nature? God is not an environmentalist. He will actually burn the trees up on several different occasions in this supernatural book. In Exodus 34:13, the Lord even commands Moses and Israel to cut down the groves. You see, men begin to use the shade of the trees to worship their false gods under. Because the shade... The shadow thereof is good under them trees, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Isn't it something that man even has to take something that God created to make their own false gods? That's what they do with the trees. In Deuteronomy 4.28, it says, And there you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor walk, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell, you see, your false gods are made out of what God created. Yet, for some reason, they think that it's superior to God. <laughs> I bet the devil was up there in the second heaven, plotting about what he could do with those trees. Now, day four, you got the sun, moon, and stars. Genesis 1, 14 through 16. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Well, the greater light is the sun. The lesser light is the moon. And to this very day, thousands of years into human history, man spends billions of dollars trying to reach the lesser light that God made. Just reaching the moon is considered a great feat for man. But did they even get that far? One guy said he was watching the moon, moon landing live on TV when it happened, so he went out and looked up and the moon wasn't even out that night. He said it was a complete sham. They have the greatest brains on the planet trying to figure out the smallest details of what God created 6,000 years ago, yet they think they're smarter than God. Romans 11.33 says his ways are past finding out. Romans 11.34 says for who hath known the mind of the Lord. Can you imagine how powerful you would have to be to create the sun or just to have the moon standing still up there and not falling? You see, he's up upholding all things by the word of his power. Can you imagine how powerful you would have to be to be able to use the sun as a weapon? You see, Spider-Man has webs. Thor has a hammer. Batman has all kinds of stuff. But what does the Lord have? Oh, nothing. Just the sun. What's more powerful than someone who can control the sun? You know, some smart guys say you could fit 1.3 million earths in the sun. Maybe you can. I wouldn't doubt it. But God is a being that goes beyond our comprehension. He has the sun and all other stars in his arsenal. He could take them and throw them at you if he wanted to. He could use the stars as his ninja stars. Nobody, nobody's standing the chance. Genesis 1.16, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also.
No biggie. He made the stars also. According to the Bible, there is an innumerable amount of stars. It says in Psalm 147, 4 and 5, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power His understanding is infinite. He telleth the number of the stars. He could count the stars. He knows them all by name. They got this thing where you can name your own star. Too late. God already named them. He already gave them a name. In Genesis 1.17, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. You see, God is the only reason you have the lights turned on. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Once again, you see... Dividing the light from the darkness. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And I'm sure old Lucifer was out there in his new evil villain's lair and saying, The sun. That gives me an idea for a sun god. Or how about a moon god? And he saw the stars and he thought about horoscopes. And he just looked at God's creation. How can I use this against God? Now, day five, you got birds and fish. Genesis one twenty, and God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. You see that? Water's connected to life. He used water to give life. And when you get saved, the Bible says, Out of the... Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John seven thirty eight. You see, when you read the supernatural book, it washes your spirit just like Drano going through clogged up pipes. And the Lord sanctifies and cleanses with the washing of water by the word. We can use the book, this supernatural book, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. It is the ultimate weapon against evil. It is our sword. And through this supernatural book, you will see the story of it forming. Genesis 1.21 And God created great wells, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. The Lord mentions the well, maybe because it reminds us of the Lord's resurrection. The Lord already made a promise to himself that he was going to fix the mess before the world began. He already knew about the death, burial, and resurrection. It was just his little secret. And God created great wells, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Do you realize that everything in the ocean was created by God himself? People are amazed by the ocean. And the creatures in the darkest parts that haven't even been discovered yet. The Lord knows what is in the deepest part. Daniel 2.22 says he revealeth the deep and secret things. He knows knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. Genesis 1.22 And God blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. Take note that the Lord uses the word fill in verse 22 and not replenish. Take note of that. Genesis 123 in the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now day six, you got land animals, you got man, you got the tree of life and tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 1:24 through 26, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. He said, let us make man in our image. You see, the Lord is one God. He is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And just as man, he made man with a body, soul, and spirit, God is also a three-part being. Explaining the Godhead or the Trinity, as people call it, is something man has tried to do for 
thousands of years. I mean, the explanation for it is laid out thoroughly up there in a file cabinet guarded by a bunch of angels, and maybe we'll get to read all about it one day when we get a glorified body. But right now, I couldn't sit and explain to you the Godhead. I just know that First John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The best way to explain the Godhead is just say those three are one. That's as far as I want to go with it. I can't understand God. Genesis 1, 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Imagine the devil up there in the second heaven witnessing as God sculpted out Adam out of the dust. And I'm sure he got to watching as he formed the man and noticed something different. He noticed something that Adam had that the cherubim and the seraphim and the angels did not have. It was a soul. Adam became a living soul. God created man to have a spirit, soul, and body, as First Thessalonians 5.23 would say. And imagine the jealousy the devil felt when he found this out. Not only did Adam come into possession of the throne that used to be Lucifer's, Adam also had something else the devil didn't have, a soul. Maybe this is when the devil decided to damn as many precious souls to hell as he could. Maybe this is when he decided to deceive men into selling themselves to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Maybe he was so jealous of Adam because he didn't have a soul and Adam had a soul that his main purpose began to be to get as many souls as he possibly could. Genesis 1.28, And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. People say you can't call Adam a king. Well, notice that Adam is given dominion. Uh, the definition of that is sovereign or supreme authority, the power of governing and controlling. Also consider how in Psalm 8, 5 it says he was crowned, crowned with glory and honor. You see, the Lord stripped the dominion and crown from Lucifer when he fell positionally and he gave it to Adam. And notice the word replenish. He told him, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Remember when I told you to note the word fill back there a few verses earlier? He didn't say be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Here, here he said replenish. So notice the word replenish. He didn't say fill as he did to the creatures in the waters and to the birds. He told them to replenish. You see, Adam and Eve were, the plan was for them to replenish the earth and replace those sons of God that rebelled. In Genesis 1.28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. He wants them to replenish, because there was something here before. It wasn't another human race, but rather there was Lucifer, the angels, and other heavenly beings. Lucifer had a throne. He rebelled. The catastrophe happened, and God recreated the earth, remade it however you want to call it. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is, upon all, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed to you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. The only reason you get to eat is because God allows you to have food. The only reason you get to breathe is because God made the air. In Genesis 1.31 it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. In Genesis 1.2 it gives greater detail on the creation of man. 
And Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The only reason the toughest guy on the planet is alive because one day God breathed breath into the first man. God formed a man from the dust of the ground. And all the complex stuff of how the body works was worked out of the dust. How did God do it? In Exodus eight seventeen through 19, the Lord uses the rod of Aaron to turn the dust of the earth to lice. This was a wonder that the satanic magicians couldn't counterfeit. Satan can't bring life from dust like God can. But Genesis 2.11 shows us that there was gold around this place where Adam was formed. Could it be that he was originally created from gold dust? Maybe a gold glorified body? Imagine the envy of the dragon, Lucifer up there, in the second heaven as he sees the new golden boy being formed. You know, Luke 3.38 calls Adam the son of God. I'd say Satan saw Adam as daddy's new little favorite, maybe the golden boy. That is probably how he saw the rest of the human race after that. I mean, the envy would have been strong for the devil and his angels when they looked towards Adam. Genesis 2.8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So the Lord, the Lord formed you and gave you a job as well. He put Adam in the garden to dress it and to keep it. He has you where you're at for a purpose as well. But imagine Lucifer up there in the second heaven. I believe the Lord takes another shot at the devil by placing Adam in Eden. Because remember in Ezekiel 28, it shows you that this is where the devil was before he fell. He says in Ezekiel 28, 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. And I'm sure Lucifer believed that Adam was trying to reign in his territory. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 9, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Obviously, all of the trees that God made were pleasant to the sight. And there were two very mysterious trees that God made in the garden. He made the tree of life, and he made the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But more on those later. Genesis 2.21 And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and stood thereof. The Lord has the power to put you under. He could make you go to sleep and never wake up. He could put the devil in a coma if he wanted to. The Lord is about to perform a surgery on Adam that would take a doctor years of schooling to be able to perform. It says in Genesis 2, 22, In the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. How do you make a woman out of a rib? Well, anything is possible with God. He made Adam from dust. So, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now day seven. You have rest. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which he had created and made. And obviously God doesn't have to rest because he's tired. He's simply seizing from his work because it's finished. And one day Jesus Christ did all the work that needed to be done for your redemption, and he said, It's finished. So Jesus Christ is your rest. And when you got in him, you ended your work. He did all the work for you. But this was where the battle began. God divided the light from the darkness. Lucifer was up there plotting, looking at the creation, seeing the trees, thinking how can he use these trees to go against God. Looking at the sun, how can he use the sun to go against God. How can he use the fish to go against God? He sees the soul of man. And he's thinking to himself, 
I don't have a soul. I'm going to go and get as many of these precious souls as I can and take them from the Lord. And this is where the battle begins.